Welcome Game Chasers everywhere to episode 27 of the Collecting Confidant with your host, Gunstar Hero. And I'm back this week with another Solar News Report, which of course stands for the State of Limited Print and Retail News Report. And this is of course where I take a trio of games typically and do some previews of either games that I haven't really played yet or games that maybe don't require a full episode but can be inserted into kind of a volume of games to talk about and of course the three games we're going to be talking about this week all have a similar theme in terms of the fact that they're all retro side-scrolling action adventure games the first game we're going to talk about is a re-release of one of the rarest arcade games known to history cannon dancer also known as Osman in the West. This was released back in February of 1996 and was developed by the Mitchell Corporation, which was responsible for the Buster Brothers series. Now, if you're seeing the gameplay footage and you're thinking, hey, this looks a lot like Capcom's Strider, which came out in 1989, well, you wouldn't be too far off because Cannon Dancer, or Osman, is the unofficial sequel to Strider and was directed by the same director who made Strider, known as Koichi Yotsui. But of course, we're going to be concentrating on Cannon Dancer, which was lost for many years and thankfully is now getting a digital release. TBA Quarter 1 2023 on the PS4, PS5, Switch, and on the Xbox One, and then also getting a physical release, which is now open for pre-order via strictlylimitedgames.com, which is for the PS4, PS5, and Switch only, and I'll be getting into those buy options in a bit. So, Cannon Dancer, like Strider, is a side-scrolling action run-and-jump game with a lot of verticality, where instead of Strider's main character, Hiryu, with all of his weapons and ninja attacks, now you're playing as a Middle Eastern hero known as Kirin, where instead of having a assortment and array of weapons at your disposal, you're simply going to be using your fists, your kicks, and your sliding slash dashing maneuvers to beat up your enemies. And what's really cool about the mechanics in this is that instead of having weapons, you can collect these red power-ups that will allow you to have up to four body images that will accompany you as you attack your enemies to add extra attack power to your overall combat style. So loosely, here's the story. We're talking about the late 21st century, early 22nd century, where the world is now governed by a one world government known simply as the Federation or the federal government. And you've been sent to reclaim this city that's been taken over by this terrorist cult that worships the goddess Abdullah the Slaver. And essentially this goddess has come over, basically scared the crap out of everyone, caused all this fear and panic, so much so that all economic activity has stopped and now the goddess is claiming that she is humanity's only chance for survival. So of course you're being sent in to take care of business and along the way you're going to be running into a bunch of intrigue, betrayal, government secrets and all that kind of fun stuff. Now the game itself is very frenetically paced and in fact either as a pro or con, can be completed in about half an hour or so. You gotta remember that this is an arcade game that was designed for short experiences, right? The average game would have been about a minute back in the day, so these games weren't super long, but it makes up for its lack of length in terms of its pacing. This game, I would almost say, is even more frenetic than Strider, it really never lets up. The action is just constantly going. Even when you beat a boss, you're right into the next scene. And of course, to accompany that frenetic pace, you also have this pumping soundtrack and these incredible psychedelic visuals with some truly insane character and boss designs that are really something to behold with this whole Middle Eastern flair. Of course, you're going to go across six different stages with exotic locales, including scenes from the Middle East and even the Czech Republic. So a lot of cool settings you don't typically see in a game like this. But again, the Strider influence shines through here in terms of the verticality. You can climb onto walls and ceilings. The ninja action is intense and nonstop. And there's definitely some challenge here. Although I will say I watched the whole game being played from start to finish. I'd say not the hardest game in the world. So definitely if you're looking for something lengthy, beware. I'd say I could recommend this game more to if you're just a fan of Strider and that whole series. If you want to kind of collect the whole collection, this might be something worth adding to your library. So in terms of its historical imprint and being, again, one of the most rare arcade games known to existence, only finally getting a console release next year, I'd say it's 
definitely something to keep on your radar from that standpoint. If you are interested in the physical version, you can go over now to strictlylimitedgames.com and place your pre-order. There is no pre-order deadlines as per usual, strictlylimitedgames.com. There's just a set number of copies for each platform remaining. So let's get into those options now. Of course, you have the standard and the collector's versions for each of the platforms, the Switch, the PS4 and the PS5. The standard version goes for $29.99 USD, contains either the cart or the disc and the manual. And then you've also got the collector's editions for $69.99 US, which contains a whole bunch of other stuff like the CD soundtrack, a big box, a material book, stickers and arcade flyers and such. These are already going as of the recording of these videos. So if you're interested in having this piece of history, you may want to act sooner than later. So again, we have an um, estimated TBA release date of Q1 2023 for the digital versions. I would expect shortly thereafter for the physical version via strictlylimitedgames.com. Open for pre-order now. Up next on the Solar Report is a, another classic 2D action-adventure platformer, which was considered to be not only one of the greatest games of the Sega Master System from which it was originally released, but also one of the greatest 8-bit games of all time, up there with like Mario, Zelda, and Metroid, which this game borrows heavily from. We're of course talking about Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap, which is now getting a physical release for the PS5 and the PC via limitedrungames.com, but you can also still get the PS4 version and the Switch version via Nicholas.com, and I'll be getting into all those buying and pricing options a bit later, but first about the game. Now, Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap is a remake of the classic Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap, which came out in 1989 for the Sega Master System, was the third game in the Wonder Boy series, originally developed by West One and headed up by Ryuichi Nishizawa, who is also a consultant on the remake. We'll get into that soon as well. So the Dragon's Trap was a remake of the original version with some quality of life improvements. The remake came out in April 2017, originally for the PS4, the Switch, and the Xbox One, and then eventually got PC, Mac, Linux, mobile and amazon luna ports in the years after that and of course with a ps5 version to follow we don't have any data on it yet but you can of course pre-order the physical version now which we'll get into soon so if you've never played the original wonder boy 3 or the remake let's set it up very quickly so wonder boy 3 takes place immediately after the events of wonder boy and monster land which is the second game in the series so essentially what's happening now is wonder boy goes and defeats the mecha dragon but then gets cursed and changes form into lizard man and now must go on a quest across all these different regions to regain his human form and over the quest will unlock secrets upgrade abilities and gear use weapons find clues and transform into other different animal forms after beating a succession of different dragon bosses. So it's really fun being able to switch between these characters and their different abilities. And eventually there is actually a sword that you can find in the game that will allow you to switch on the fly, which is very cool. And that's the thing about this game is the secrets, which in the way that they're done and laid out is definitely a little dated and archaic and is really indicative of old 80s platformers like Super Mario Brothers and the old Wonder Boy games where secrets weren't very obvious back then. That's the way to put it. Back then in the late 80s, early 90s, it was expected that you're going to read strategy guides and go to gaming magazines to get hints about some of these very obtuse clues. So that is definitely one of the things that if you're impatient and you don't have all the time in the world like we did when we were kids to find all these secrets, you may find yourself going to a strategy guide once in a while to find the hidden doors and some of the secret gear you need to find to beat certain levels a little bit easily. This game is still very enjoyable albeit the mechanics are a little bit floaty and kind of dated but it still works and it's still very fluid and fun and the level design is put together so well that it'll just kind of keep you coming back for more with very little frustration but then you've got the remake which is called wonder boy the dragon's trap now this originally was conceived as early as 1998 by omar cornut by lizard cube who is the developer of this game and of course you've got dot mu publishing this 
Cornell was a huge fan of the series, but was also very skilled in reverse engineering old games from their original code. So what he did was he got access to the ROM and the code of Wonder Boy 3, started reverse engineering it, and what his whole thing was is he wanted to make the gameplay as close to the original as possible, and he even went as far to bring Ryuichi Nishizawa, the original Wonder Boy's creator, he brought him on board as a consultant to really nail down the gameplay and get his blessing. So I will say, comparatively to the old game, this game definitely feels right at home, the remake of course, in terms of being compared to the old game. So if you're a big fan and a master of the old game, you'll be able to immediately just jump in. But then of course, you will notice a lot of quality of life improvements as well. So for example, the physics have been cleaned up and a lot smoother. You've got the frame rate, which has been bumped from 30 frames to 60 frames. You now are able to select your sub weapons like your arrows and fireballs on the fly, rather than having to go back to your inventory and select them there. You've also got this new thing where they got rid of the whole necessity to get some charms to buy new weapons and gear. And then of course you have these new unknown areas, which are these extra dungeons that are specific to each character, which you can complete and get some extra gear, which I think is very cool. On top of that, you've got not only Wonder Boy, but you've got Wonder Girl as a selectable character. Even though using Wonder Girl won't add anything new to the gameplay, although I was told that if you play as her, the dungeons that you'll be able to access, those unknown areas are a little bit different. Otherwise, it's cool to be able to select between the two genders. But the really big bright spot with the remake that just stands out in my opinion is the art style done by Ben Fiquette and the tremendous, breathtaking orchestral music store done by Michael Gier, which is selectable right from the beginning, but then also what's cool about this game is you can go back and forth on the fly between the old retro Sega Master System graphics, which are now in 16 by nine, and then the new hand-drawn graphics just with the click of a button, but then also if you click another button, you can switch on the fly between the new orchestral rearranged score and the original chiptune audio so you can mix and match. You can have the new graphics with the old audio or the old graphics with the new audio, and then you can even go into the options menu and add further options like scan lines and even access for the first time in the West the original FM Sega Master System audio, which is only available to people in the East. We never got that here in the West. So again, just really cool fan service and a lot of nostalgia here, in addition to taking something that was already great, but just cleaning it up for modern audiences and really making something accessible that definitely feels old, but also feels new. And trust me, the graphics and the audio are just going to pull you right in, in addition to the enhanced mechanics. I really recommend this if you're a fan of old, late 80s, early 90s platformers. If you are a Sega kid, you're going to find yourself right at home because this 100% this feels like an old Sega Master System game. It just has that feel. The bosses, yeah, they're a little bit easy. Some of the gameplay elements are a little archaic, but overall won't detract from the fun factor here. Recommend this for old retro lovers. And again... Finally, getting a PS5 and PC release courtesy of LimitedRunGames.com. So those pre-orders are open until Sunday, October 2nd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You've got a standard edition for the PS5 only for $34.99 US. And then you've got the collector's editions for both the PS5 and the PC, which is including the big box, CD soundtrack, and then for the PC version, a USB key and a disc. You also get a poster with the collection as well. And those collector's editions are going for $64.99 US. But, of course, if you still want the PS4 or the Switch version, you can actually still get those via Nikalis.com for $29.99 US. So a lot of buying options. Definitely don't go to eBay for this one because you've got a lot of current buy options without having to break an arm and a leg financially to get this. So that's Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap, the remake, available for pre-order now. Finally, for our third game of this week's Solar News Report, we're going to be covering a compilation of some highly requested games from Bandai Namco's history. This one is going to be the Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series, which came out July 7th, 2022 for the PS4, PS5, Switch, Windows, Xbox One, and Series X and S, and now is available for physical purchase from Eastern retailers. This one actually did not get a physical release in the West, but can be purchased from play-asia.com for around 35 to 45 US, depending on the version and if they're in stock. And of course, you can also get it from Video Games Plus 
out of Toronto, which is becoming a force to reckon with in the limited edition and retail print gaming industry. I'll be getting more into them in a future episode because they're actually teaming up with Red Art Games for a very special release, which I'm not going to talk about now, which I'll be doing a review of soon. But again, that's available now. Pretty easy to find. Let's talk about what makes this compilation so special and why it was so heavily demanded by fans of the series. So the Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series includes two games from the Klonoa series. The first two games, which of course would be the first game, Klonoa Door to Phantom Mile, originally came out in 1997 for the PS1. And then the sequel, which is a direct sequel on the PS2, which came out in 2001, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil. If you've never heard of these games, Klonoa is a mascot that came out of the late 90s from Bandai Namco and was directed and produced by Hideo Yoshizawa, better known as the director of one of my all-time favorite NES games, Ninja Gaiden, out of 1988. He came up with this series because... At the time, he wanted to make something more cinematic because he felt around the late 90s that other developers who were making mascot platforming games were not emphasizing story enough in their games. So he wanted to do something a bit different, make something very graphically rich, but also with a sense of lore, of a universe, and of characters you could tie yourself to. So this is where he came up with Klonoa, which is essentially one of the first 2.5D side-scrolling action platforming games, which would set the standard for games to come like the Yoshi series, and even more importantly, games like Little Big Planet. So this is kind of like the pioneer of something where, again, you're on a 2D plane going back to forth, but you're also in this 3D polygonal arena where you can go through twists and turns, the game will twist and turn with you, and you can also interact with objects in the foreground and the background. So very briefly, the story, you're Klonoa, you enter this dream world in the first game of Phantom mile in an effort to save it from this evil spirit that's hell-bent on turning this dream world into a world of nightmares. The sequel kind of borrows very loosely from that formula as well. And in terms of the gameplay mechanics, you'll be equipped with this wind ring where you can shoot gusts of winds at your enemies, which will then trap them, inflate the enemies, and you can do a few cool things with them. Number one, you can use your enemies as a platform to bounce off of to gain access to higher heights. You can also take your enemies and throw them at walls and switches and even throw them into the foreground and background to not only uncover secret items but also fight enemies in the distance or the foreground so i thought that was kind of cool it was very innovative for the time and you can see how that style has been borrowed in other platformers as of late the game itself isn't very long the first one that can be beaten in about four and a half hours whereas a sequel on ps2 is a lot longer we're talking about an overall eight hour jaunt but there's a lot to be had here if you're a fan of those old school retro platformers and collectathons like banjo kazooie back in the day i think you'll find a lot to love in this game the colors are fantastic the level design is very intuitive and good there's multiple branching pathways you can take and kanoa itself is a very charming character where, yes, it's a little bit dated in terms of the fact that there aren't a lot of mechanics to ingest, but it's also a very short game that prides itself more on story and design and style. And I still think that there's a lot to sink your teeth into for the very reasonable price tag of this compilation. Now, if you are already a fan of the games and you've played them, in terms of what this compilation is going to bring in terms of enhancements, number one, You've got the first game, which is based off the 2008 Wii remaster, so it's not based off the original PlayStation version, although it does return some of the assets that were changed in the Wii version, so those assets are reverted back to the original PlayStation version, but the game does use the original Wii remake as the basis for its design, whereas the second game, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil, is built from the ground up as a total remake of the PS2 version. Even though both games are very faithful to their original predecessors, the only minor differences are some slight enhancements to the controls and the physics. You've also got the frame rate now, which has been bumped up from 30 frames a second to 60 frames a second, and also up to 4K support for the PS5 version. In addition, the dialogue scenes, now you've got this option where you can either fast forward them or skip them outright. And you've also got now an easy mode with the ability to add a second player to both games to assist Klonoa in terms of adding little quality of life enhancements if you're finding the game a little too challenging. Now, 
Admittedly, I never played either of the original games on the PS1 or PS2, and I have not finished the new Reverie Anthology, although I did finish the demo, which is now available for download on the Nintendo Switch, so you can basically play two levels from each game, and you can get a better idea of whether this game is suitable for you. I think, again, if you're a fan of old school platformers with lots of colors, cool soundtracks, and a lot of charm, this game will definitely fill that niche and be like a good weekend game that you can get done and enjoy yourself. I'd say if you're a fan of old school 90s platformers like Crash Bandicoot and Banjo-Kazooie where the emphasis was on charm, a little bit of challenge and lots of color and really great graphics, you'll find something definitely worth sinking your teeth into here, especially in terms of that very cool 2.5D dynamic where yes, you are on a 2D plane, but the world wraps and revolves around you. I think that's pretty cool and still holds up to this day. The compilation itself was developed by Monkey Craft, which was also responsible for the remake of the original Katamari. So you can definitely tell they've got some chops in terms of bringing life to old games and adding some quality of life enhancements. So even if you played the original two games, there's definitely enough of a reason to revisit these, especially for new fans of the series. I'd say it definitely holds up in a very big regard. And if you are looking for the physical version, again, you can hop on over to www.play-asia.com get it anywhere somewhere between 35 to 45 us or you can hit other boutique retailers like video games plus out of toronto with supplies as they last so this has been another episode of the solar news report from the collecting confidant me gunstar hero thank you again for watching our 27th episode make sure you like and subscribe and we'll see you on the next one later game chasers and peace